Hello, everybody from around the globe, and uh, it's always wonderful to see you waiting in the queue at the line, that is, I didn't mean the 17th letter of the alphabet. So here we are, What is Truth, episode 86, and I'm here with the insightful Reverend David William Perry. And uh, my name is John Barnwell, of course. I'm here in the city of Detroit, Detroit, the Straits. And Reverend David, his abode is in the city of London in the merry old England, as we say. And this is an interesting day in history for more than a few reasons. This is, this is the day that... Uh, William the Conqueror, as he became known, or William the Bastard, as, as he was also known, uh, was made Duke in Normandy. And so that's an interesting take on the state of the affairs today is that what is it with this whole idea of nobility that people tend to bow their heads before these worldly lords when I would much rather bow my head towards the Curios, the heavenly lord. And But, you know, we all have our failings, and he played his role in the course of history, crossing, interestingly, in 1066, under a solar eclipse, which is interesting really fo like following the eclipse path, kind of a strange serendipity. Today is also uh, the birthday of Julian Assange, and I can only wish him the best and hope that he finally gets released. That's the probably one of the first things that number 45 should have done, but he didn't because he has a bunch of ridiculous people around him giving him bad information. And now, of course, we have a, a leader that just gives bad information on a daily basis, but uh, old 46. And uh, so things are strange over here. Of course, they're strange around the world, but we didn't come here to talk about all that kind of stuff. We're, this is not a political conversation. This is uh, something that has to do with it. It is dwelling beyond the world of appearances. And so I'd like to share with you an excerpt from a, a lecture that really is uh, not very well known, but it, because it was so early, uh, it's what does the human or what does the modern human being find in theosophy? He's still using the term theosophy because this is back in March 8th of 1904. This is in the uh, collected edition, volume 52. But that being said, uh, he says in regards to conscience, and I think it's a very concise, the way in which this unfolds. Rudolf Steiner says, I want to mention another phenomenon the conscience. This phenomenon is inexplicable at first. It becomes immediately clear to us if we look at its development, if we know that every soul shows a particular level of development, then we admit that the urge for the world of figures, that's the world of the senses, then we admit that the urge for the world of figures lives in the undeveloped soul. However, if the spirit has drawn the soul unto itself, has united more and more with it, the spirit will speak at any moment of sympathy and antipathy. As a result, the individual hears the spirit speaking from within the soul and perceives this as the voice of conscience. This conscience can appear only at a particular stage of human development. 
we never see the voice of conscience with undeveloped individuals. Later, when the soul has gone through different personalities, the mind speaks to the soul. These are the main concepts of the theosophical worldview. And you have seen how clear this view is for that world of external forms. Yes, we would never understand this world of forms if we did not understand them from our mind. However, somebody who lives only in the external world of figures, who could be carried away within the world of forms, is on the level of the transient, is on that level where he develops selfishness and egoism, because our external form only has interest in the world of forms. But he develops out of selfishness because the spirit begins speaking more and more. However, we only recognize the spirit, which is the same in any human being, if we bring ourselves to consider the eternally imperishable, the innermost core of the human being. For we recognize the human being only in his innermost being if we get to their spirit. If we recognize the innermost core of a human being, we recognize the spirit in ourselves. However, only those who regard the other human being as a brother or sister understands the spirit in the other human being, for they understand them only if they completely embrace brotherliness. So, Reverend David, how are you there, my friend? Well, always good to speaking to you, John. I got a bit of a frog in my throat. Um, today was very hard going uh, because we had our monthly Sunday uh, service of worship um, and we're trying to get out of the sort of COVID mentality lockdown um, and we need to start doing some more. But at the moment, the people I work with aren't used to the rhythm uh, of church going. I mean, we, we hold hybrid services for the elderly that can't get there and some of them will never get there again. You know, that's that's life. It's, it's, it's not, neither good nor bad. Things could be better, but it's life. And uh, there are some very vulnerable members of our congregation, and they're just terrified to go out, uh, period. Um, but, you know, today was tough. We had a tough <clears throat> preparation this morning, a very tough service for all sorts of reasons. Um, beautiful, uplifting, but tough. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, yeah, I'm more thinking of the 4th of July than inbred aristocracies, um, which I've no time for at all. Death to all of it. Um, blue blood's my arse. Who says you are? Right, okay, let's let's see if you've got blue blood chop. Um, you know, no, no. Um, Fourth of July and all that stuff. War of Independence, great stuff. That's what we need. We need more of that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, if anyone looks through my Athos book, they'll probably realise I think British history and possibly Euro his, European history went wrong with the Norman invasion. Um, <clears throat> because what you have, <clears throat> excuse me, you had some very, I promise not to do that again to deafen you again. Um, you had some actually quite advanced settlements uh, in Britain. And it's the same ethnic group. People have to remember that. The, the, the Normans uh, were the same ethnic group as the people they were attacking. It's just they were more rudimentary and a lot more savage. Um, and the settlements, they decided, you know, let's not sugarcoat it and give it some Disney flourishes. I mean, th these are villages with a big house every now and again. You know, you're not looking at Disney castles everywhere. Uh, they were actually more advanced and trading on a European level, which the Normans didn't understand and put a stop to. Um, they introduced wonderful customs like serfdom. You know, you belong to this land, you're now our slave. And they started all this ridiculous bowing and scraping to toughs in the first place. No, the whole thing needs to go. The whole thing needs to go. If I don't go as far as Diderot, <clears throat> though I've, uh, anyone who knows the show uh, knows this show knows I have a great admiration for the philosophers. Um, I believe that the statement, a little harsh, 
on his part was until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest, there won't really be democracy. I can, I can sort of see where he's going with that. I can sort of see where he's going with that. <coughs> but I'm a minister. I'm a minister. Um, no, I, oh, I wish it would all just go away and I wish the British could grow up. Um, and it's time to think of the positive and the evolutionary inside all of us. And remember that, you know, that the trouble with history is, a, is that it isn't a continuous progressive flow. The Norman invasion, I'm amazed it wasn't just a solar eclipse. I'm, I'm amazed the stars didn't fall out of the sky at the same time. I mean, these were ignorant savages and bully boys who decide to build fortifications, which will one day become castles to defend themselves against the local population. That's the Norman invasion. Um, you know, no, the, um, you know a, a massive example of European retrograde history. And of course it had repercussions on the continent. You know, it's, it's very, very unwise to think it's just that lot coming here. It had repercussions everywhere because it made it look for a century or so like bully boys and bully boy tactics would get you anywhere you wanted to. And therefore, all, you know, there were ripples across the European mainland. Um, it's just a shame that ever took place in the first place, but it did. Um, it introduced that type of mentality, which is, you know, on your knees. Do the heavenly powers want any of us on our knees? I like this Muslim thing. Uh, but you mentioned yourself a minute ago, where you only bow before God. I think that's incredibly healthy. You know, any any man or a woman, right? You're a man or a woman, right? You've got a couple of titles. You're a man or a woman, right? That God is God. You know, that's an entirely different thing. And even then, is God really asking us to do that? I mean, he's asking us to crook the knee in a sense, because what he wants, in other words, is his will, her will, its will to be done, by which by which the divine means love and wisdom. Love and wisdom needs to be pursued in every world and sanctified and expressed and lived. You know, therefore, metaphorically crooking the knee to that one, I can see as nothing but attractive and indeed generally uplifting. But all this other stuff, no, 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 no. Of course, that mentality is coming back with a vengeance at the moment. Only, of course, this time it's not bully boys working for a couple of foreign malcontents. Now, it's corporations owned by the same arist aristocratic families. Let's be honest, it's the same people again. They were getting their corporations to cripple the world this time and get us all on our knees to commerce uh, where we will not benefit. You know, what's that wonderful phrase going around at the moment? You will own nothing and you will be happy. Right, so hang on. Your class owns everything and you're happy but we own nothing and we're happy. Yeah, 1066, 1066, that's all I'm hearing. And um, while you're at it, uh, ha enjoy having some bugs. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, John, believe me, you will be happier when you can do nothing in life. Um, you know, all, all this is en en the endless replay of greedy bastards who will stop at nothing to reduce the children of God to, to servitude, and it's time we really saw it for what it is and stood up against it. Are you looking forward to the 4th of July, John? <laughs> well, I, I pushed your buttons. That's good. I like to hear a, a Reverend David diatribe just as much as the next guy. A uh, little bit of obscurity going on in the comments. I won't get to them as of yet. Well, you know, uh, keep in mind that, that things evolve. And just as that was something that was actually uh, quite typical in that time, you know, around 1066, there were marauding armies going all over the place. And so uh, it's easy for us to look back on it with our sense of reference in today and say, oh, you bad guys, you doing all that. and uh, But actually, uh, in fact, Paramahansa Yogananda, he was convinced that he was the reincarnation of William the Conqueror. So I guess 
if that's if that's true, then it, it's it's living living proof that people do evolve. But uh, it's kind of tricky when you get into that whole thing because it's a mixed blessing that actually was a uh, key within the, especially within the age of Gabriel that preceded the age of Michael in which we're now in. But what happens with these shifts in the archangelic periods is there's a lot of carryover, uh, old baggage from the previous archangelic period. And so we get kind of the last halo of this whole idea of feudalism. That's, you know, essentially what's going on now, what they're trying to put forward is neo-feudalism. I mean, let's let's make no bones about it, that the steering committee uh, for all of this is down the street from you in the city of London. And so they're, they're, they like that uh, state of affairs very much. They like to, they like to control things. And being that at one time, the sun never set on the British Empire. They like that perspective on the world, but now it's it's done through corporate mergers. And so what gets in the way of corporate mergers, uh, success with them? Well, it's the little guy. So let's see what we can do to starve out the little guy, and then we'll be the only people left standing. And so that's the kind of world that we're living in right now. We're a great deal of people have been put under water for no reason at all other than the negative effects of this egoism that, that Rudolf Steiner was referring to, uh, actions without conscience. And that's a real key in understanding that if you really want to move forward uh, along the lines of which we've discussed here for some 86 episodes, then you at least want to begin to get glimmerings of that voice in the heart that Rudolf Steiner is referring to. That's that still small voice that uh, St. John talks about it. And uh, in fact, in the Gospel of St. John, in a lecture that Rudolf Steiner gave in 1906, Collected Works 94, he says, there is, however, still another way of understanding this. And one acquires it if one returns day after day to the momentous words, in the beginning was the word. When one begins to understand, not with the intellect, but with the heart, so that the heart becomes one with these words, then the power begins to work. And there begins the state of mind, which John speaks. He says it with great clarity. All things were made by him, and without the word was not anything made that was made. In every single man there lives a divine man. In the distant future this divine man will arise, resurrected in every man. As man stands before us today, he is in his outward appearance, to a greater or lesser extent, an expression of the inner divine man. And this inner divine man works constantly on the outer man. Of course, by man, it's not gender specific, but referring to man, which has a root in the word manas, which means mind. So the ones that have minds, for the most part, are human beings. I think there's, there's quite a few out there today, it looks like they don't even have one. They are uh, uh, merely an echo chamber. And so these are things that we have to take up. But it's not something that's going to intrude on us. And that's why John calls it the still small voice, because you have to call it forth. It's through your striving that these things come into being. And that's why the words of power are the Lord's Prayer. And by taking up the Lord's Prayer, you empower yourself to be able to approach the throne of God. And it's, it, I, I can't even begin to tell you how moving that that can be if you make it a practice. The, the Lord's Prayer in the first 14 verses in the Gospel of John that helps you understand why you're doing it in the first place. But see, it's entering into that personal relationship 
with the being of Christ that one day will lead you into the experience to where when you pass into the next world at the end of this life, instead of running into Lucifer, you run into Christ. I'm sorry, my brother just uh, returned home and called up from downstairs to say everything was okay. Um, we need to make Christ more central to our lives. Uh, what can I say? Um, curiously, <coughs> I haven't got back into giving a regular sermon yet. I didn't used to do that when we went into COVID time at St. Valentine's Hall. I used to give a very brief homily as opposed to a fully developed sermon. This is uh, Pride Weekend um, in London. Pride Month. Why do we need a month? But Pride Month has come to an end and they have the Pride Parade around now. I, I was relating a story um, a little earlier, which some people might find interesting. You know, if the other ch if churches want to go around calling people evil and intrinsically evil, they must take on board the fact they are complicit, not only in the shedding of innocent blood, which has happened a lot, uh, but also uh, in the self-image and the damage to self-imagery that that entails if certain LGBTQIA plus people then turn into unpleasant, rebellious, awkward people. Maybe it's something to do with the intellectual environment they're raised in and they're forced to operate in. If positive role models are never allowed to arise, what do people expect? I mean, my whole attitude to little Naz, who seems to be traumatizing America, or at least was recently, was roughly along those lines. It, how many times had he been told he was a son of evil? Okay, then he turned into, into that type of, I, I'm going to do whatever I want in my rock videos, sod you. Um, if, that, if people can't find... The logic, I didn't say sympathise, if they can't see the grim logic uniting the different aspects of that situation, then they know little about life. <coughs> oh, gosh, excuse me. Hang on, John. Um, I'm, I raised that because, of course, when I, I've been on Pride myself, I mean, I'm 64 this year, um, and I, I'm still an activist. But I think I'm I'm venerable. I, I've reached the stage of venerable this year. So, you know, when I used to go on, you know, knocking policemen's hats off, chaining myself to railings and all that sort of stuff. Great fun. Great fun. I'm not sure my back would be up to it these days. You know, and it would take me half an hour to get up off the pavement. You know, sorry, officer. Can you, can you give me a helping hand? I need to stand up now. So it's probably best if I don't do all those things nowadays. When those marches started, it was nearly anathema because, of course, there's a chain reaction on the other side. No one would have heard anything religious. No one would have heard any Christian song in any of those marches. Um, midway through my own personal attendance in those marches, uh, not only were American churches like MCC beginning to make a little headway over here, but the other denominations some of them anyway, were beginning to realise, OK, this is an issue we need to start discussing. And Christian song had started to appear. The last time I went on one of these shindigs, <clears throat> I noticed there were other types of religious song as well. There were, hin there were Hindus singing. There were Muslims, LGBT Muslims singing. I could only see that as progress and evolution on both sides of the equation. Um, not only were important social issues, issues of the social gospel. I mean, we, are you, as I said on this show before, and all, I think all of you know, it was always me in the past. You know, why must we talk about the social gospel? Why must we talk about the social gospel? Um, and, uh, you know, why aren't we pursuing higher states of consciousness? And I still hold by that. But nowadays, with the way things are going and regressing again, we do need to start talking about the social gospel once more. But the balance, you know, evolution balances itself. The, the forces of progress balance themselves. Balance themselves. Not only was the wider society around me beginning to say, okay, we need to dialogue. But within the LGBTQI plus, yada, yada, I can't remember how many letters it's got now. Um, there was also an understanding that the spirit was a reality. Religion was a reality. No, it wasn't just crushing 
a minority and that needed to be expressed as well that is genuine progress on both sides against all the odds <clears throat> therefore who can honestly say they wouldn't want to see christ at the end of their earthly pilgrimage you know after all the struggles and all the tears and all the hurts and all the conflicts is it really lucifer that we want to see at the end of that journey i'm sure it's not <clears throat> which is why anthroposophy for me is not only an incredible tool of adjustment it's telling us the way we can do those things john i'm going to have to pass it back to you but my voice is i've been speaking my voice is going handing it back yes well and, and that's kind of the 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 vantage point at which you can look at these things because these days and, and you mention it on occasion that uh prelates your 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 priests and your pastors uh have become glorified social workers and the church has become a glorified real estate company you know and uh that they and that with a collection and so i mean it's pretty interesting the way things have developed but it's it's getting to the point though that a transition has to be made and that transition is in consciousness but it's very clear uh, the way in which rudolf steiner presents anthroposophy over some internally consistent five to six thousand however many lectures and 50 books and articles it just tells you how much uh energy that he personally received because i mean if he was just making this up he wouldn't have been able to be consistent first of all second of all how in the world do you even give you know thousands of lectures and then you know be in charge of, of so many different areas of specialized development and then be artistically creative and uh, develop a new uh, way of approaching art a way of approaching science medicine architecture dance music the list goes on and on and but yet uh in in the modern world there's very few individuals in the kind of normative boundaries of of culture that we're living in that, that that's whole wholly devoted to the realm of materiality and thinks that consciousness is a byproduct of of the material world uh, those individuals don't really know what to do with it and so they they stay away from it so Rudolf Steiner experiences the orthodox conspiracy of silence, as it was described by good old Gerald Massey, who's an interesting point in the history of uh, Egyptology. Although his his theories are are, are that. In fact, uh, Leo Zagami is a big fan of Gerald Massey, and then you have Alvin Boyd Kuhn, who is the skin of glory after that, and and other people that that try to reduce scripture to some kind of astronomical allegory. And so there's all these various viewpoints to which one can get caught up in, and you know, uh, check it out. I have I've read read at all those people. And uh, but I came out the other side because it didn't speak to my heart, and I guess that's that's my personal take on it. And and being that I'm somebody who spent a great many years working in Egyptology, creating a relational database of some fifteen thousand volumes or something, it led me to uh, the experience that is described in, in the Papyrus of Ani, for example, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, where they have the, the uh, ibis-headed thought that he's, he's like the recording angel. And then they have a heart, they call the ab, and it's, and it's on a scale, and it's being weighed against a feather. 
and if the heart outweighs the feather, there's this weird creature with sharp teeth just sitting there waiting for its next meal. And that's kind of a strong image, but that's kind of the way in which we have to look at the mystery of the Sphinx, the mystery of uh, the centaur. He's a man in the top and below he's an animal. And it's that animal part that is uh, manifesting in this worldly, secular worldview. That's, that's that whole process of, of brain thinking devoid of heart forces. And so it's very easy for someone like that to think it's perfectly rational to think that, well, why don't we, we could save a bunch of money. Let's just have them eat bugs. <laughs> but uh, if you follow that path, uh, I'll tell you what Rudolf Steiner has to say about that because it's it's very interesting in this lecture cycle he gave again very early in 1904, Collected Works 93. It's the volume is called the Temple Legend, and it's in Lecture Four that was on October 7th of 1904, and he says all that is predestined to perish must sacrifice itself. Man who still has an affinity with his animal nature, the centaur Chiron, has to sacrifice himself. The man of previous epochs must be sacrificed. And so it's that whole idea of, of that, there's that, uh, what Blavatsky called the Kama Rupa, the, the body of desire, and it's that whole idea of being so captivated in the world of forms, in the realm of sympathy and antipathy, that one can't hear that still small voice because your concerns are all extended outward into the world of the senses. But your experience of the world of the senses, according to Christian occultism, is that you're getting uh, an infatuation with the image in the mirror. Because were you to actually see what was behind the mirror and the, the multitude of spiritual beings there just waiting for you to come to that recognition of conscience and be able to begin your forward development as a, a spirit of freedom and love, as it was described by Rudolf Steiner, I, it's, it would be a shattering experience, to say the least. And there are those who have gone through that shattering experience. And shattering it is indeed. I think I've got my voice back. Um, yeah, no one, no one should be shattered. Um, I think the initiatic stories of the Egyptians and the Greeks are very, very interesting indeed, because they're clearly of... of parallels to the Jungian search, the search within. Of course, true religion is about the search within. I get amazed whenever I talk to my UFO friends and colleagues, one of whom said to me a couple of months ago, what has religion got to offer, you know, once UFOs turn up on the block? I'm paraphrasing. <clears throat> and I, I was so dumbfounded, I didn't know how to answer, uh, which is unlike me. I mean, you know, how can you not know that religion is the interior journey and it's not competing with things in the sky bopping about you know is the church doing such a terrible job the answer is yes that it hasn't even made that clear it's the search for religious truths within the soul i mean what is the church doing at the minute i i agree what was that song by lou reed you know where um you can't rely on the church unless it's real estate that you want to buy um i used to love lou reed um you know, Christians and Christianity have to start to take a few, you know, they need to look in the mirror of truth and they're not going to like what they see mostly because it's, you know, is it just about thoughts in the head? Is it just about dogmas and doctrines? And the answer for most people, whether they realize it or not, is yes. That's all it is. You know, you, you, it's like the new um, method. I think there's a what was it? How many pages now do you have to tick the boxes off if you want to become a Southern Baptist minister? You know, point thirteen B that you believe in such and such a such and such a doctrine as it was defined by. I mean, this is ridiculous. If you can't see it as ridiculous, 
then have you read the Gospels? You know, Jesus doesn't hold master classes to make sure people get through the central exam to be an apostle. Uh, this is ridiculous. Something is deeply wrong. Um, the Gnostic bit of me uh, is very, very proud of the fact it woke me up to the fact that religion isn't just about the knowledge of the head, I agree with you completely, although let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, every time I dip back into Hegel and realise what the rational mind has to offer before we even start to look at the super rational mind or the, or the mind that somehow is only accessed through higher consciousness, and I do mean higher consciousness, not altered consciousness. I think altered states of consciousness are absolutely an invaluable study, not only in terms of our personal meditation, but in terms of scholarship. And, you know, if present scholars are correct, and they're not wrong about everything, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, we're constantly slipping in and out of different states and different types of empirical and altered consciousness. How fascinating. Why does that scare people? That is fascinating. But it's still not talking about the Jacob's Ladder that leads us to those more lofty estates. I mean, what might, might interest you, because I haven't had the chance to tell you that and some of our listeners, is I'm actually thinking of taking the first year of studies um, in the Christian community this coming um, uh, 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 fall, this coming autumn, because, you know, what, as a liberal Catholic, as an independent Catholic, I can see that as a melding. How about that for ecumenism? We get the truth from both sides and see how they work together in this interweave of trying to lift consciousness up christian consciousness up to a different and higher level then maybe we'll be talking about the knowledge of the heart um certainly the types of gnosticism i study and i work with um you know that is one of the central phrases that returns again and again and again the knowledge of the heart <clears throat> would they have been sorry if someone like hegel turned up and wanted to become a gnostic no they wouldn't um would they have said that's only one type of knowledge? Yes, they would, and they wouldn't have discouraged that, but they'd have been be, being adamant that, you know, the knowledge of the heart is a different type of knowledge. And I think it's only in the last year or so that I've begun to realise that there are different, not only gradations of the knowledge of the heart, but different types of the knowledge of the heart, um, which lead us to all sorts of territories and areas that really only people like Steiner can guide us through. Um, we need that cartography. We need that type of prior exploration. If we're going to make sense within ourselves of true religion and not the type of weird, bombastic ideology that wants to somehow compete with UFOs and grey aliens and all that sort of stuff. And you know, how can it? Because it's nothing to do with those things. If they turn up, then that's to do with zoology, history, sociology, culture. But it's not to do with the inner journey. And they will have to, those grey boys, will have to be on the inner journey as well. Are they discovering higher states of consciousness? Is it leading them to the Christ? And if not, why aren't they doing it? Um, you know, so we've got to clarify what all these things are and where they're leading. Because sometimes it seems like the same direction when in actual fact, they're diametrically opposed by purpose and intent. I'll hand back to you, John. Well, that reminds me of a sequence of events in my youth. I began to have these experiences of, uh, because of the loosening of my etheric body, I began to receive a, a logos from my heart that I could get the inkling of the feeling regarding what was being said, but there was no conceptual basis because it was in a language uh, of all things, so to speak. And one day I was walking and this, this man, this elderly man walked up to me and he was vocalizing in that same tongue that I would hear from my heart. And he, then he smiled at me. And 
he said, yeah, I, ca I could speak any language. And I said, oh, can you speak Anakian? And he looked at me and he said, I haven't heard anybody speak that in a long time. But then he walked on and I walked on and I thought that that was very curious. And then one day I was driving my car and I saw him across the intersection from me in his car and we waved and I went on my way. So my point is, is when you enter into these new phases of your personal life, that there's other people there, that you're not alone. And that's the whole idea uh, of brotherhood. Without others, how can there be brotherhood? And, and Rudolf Steiner remember at the, at the very end of that first quote that I read you, wherever it is, right here. He says, for they understand them only if they completely embrace brotherliness. And then he goes on to say, that is why the theosophical movement calls brotherliness the ideal which the spiritual development of humankind wants to achieve under the influence of this worldview. So it's something that is coming into being. I mean, don't, don't be discouraged. Don't be disheartened. Just keep setting aside uh, points of the day in which you approach with reverence the spiritual world, whatever that means for you. I, I really don't care what denomination or even religion you are. That's not my point. My point is developing the ability to let the heart bring forth that language that, that will be pleasing unto the creator. And that's that language embraces that concept of brotherhood because that's what it is. That's the difference, uh, the fundamental difference between Christ and Lucifer, you could say, first of all, is that Lucifer is concerned about Lucifer and Christ is, is concerned about everybody else. He went through that for all these other beings. Of course, he's, he's their, the creator, he's the logos, but he's not selfish. It's absolutely selflessness that was, was brought to expression. And, that, and in, in fact, through the shedding of blood on Golgotha, there was a, uh, Rudolf Steiner talks about how it had managed to draw off some of the excess egoism that was uh, a bane for mankind at that time. Because if you remember in earlier podcasts, Rudolf Steiner had said that had Christ not incarnated in the baptism in the River Jordan and, and did that great sacrifice, that this whole evolution that, that we're developing through would have come to a premature end and we would not have been able to reach our goal. So it behooves one to, to wonder what that might mean within your personal life, but not out of fear out of reverence. Well, it always intrigues me that we, we all know that Logos, the word, is discussed in John, and then people don't make the connection that we're here to learn a language, even though the, the, the word is, is the creator. Uh, we're here to learn the language of the angels and evolve by that learning by the, those processes that are then within ourselves, within our hearts, within our minds, within our souls. You know, it amazes me that the language of the angels is tantamount to ignored by the churches nowadays. But it, it, it's weird. I mean, they're trying to diminish the human condition almost in a manner comparable to the rationalists, that other church. Um, you know, I mean, I look at some of the people, what was it, Prophecy Watch, Sky Watch? I can't remember. I was looking at it recently. And they, some of their experts, apparently if you work for them and you work in that circle, that's when you're a world expert. So there's no, there's no point of reference beyond that. It's just if they know you and they like you, then you're a world expert on something. 
Um, because, you know, when our good Lord clearly says uh, that ye shall be as gods, yeah, I, I've no doubt of that, and I'm going to say something comparable in a minute. I've, I've absolutely no doubt of that. That that's more of a common experience than any of us want to admit, and it's time to start admitting it at least to each other. That's true church when we can share those experiences with each other. Um, you know, I mean, as you know, ye shall be as gods, which is in Matthew for a start, the Gospel of Matthew. And I noticed these guys on was it Prophecy Watch actually diminishing uh, what our good Lord himself had said so it fits in with the ethos of their church? I mean, this is ridiculous. So now now the whole of the heavens have to fit in with their theology, with their view of what Christianity is. And how can that not be seen as blasphemous? How can people not see that as blasphemy? But apparently they don't, so there we are, prayers needed. Um yeah, I mean, I'm always intrigued by stories like that. And obviously your encounter raises a lot more questions than it solves, particularly with that type of phrasing. I mean, you know, so when was the last time we actually heard people speak in Nolkin? That would be interesting. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out. I'm coming out of my closet wherein I went to pray, amongst other things. Um, and admit, you know, uh, it was the summer of 1976. Uh, where the paranormal went berserk in my life. It started with two balls of orange light directly above my head. Uh, I lived in a market town at that time, Fareham in Hampshire, pretty, pretty, pretty little English place um, that were literally zooming down, plummeting at an unbelievable speed to, to land on top of me. I thought they were, it was at such a speed, they were so high up it was ridiculous. But at such a speed, I thought basically they were going to crash into me. They did a, a, a U-type flight pattern and shot back up into the sky um, and disappeared, which started. So in other words, there's intelligence and there's technique because a U-turn means uh, cognition is involved. Uh, it opened up months of seeing balls of light in various ways, all sorts of bizarre experiences all of which came to an abrupt halt nothing like it has, has ever happened to me since uh, where i saw one of the balls of light literally generating colors around itself now i knew a very learned occultist at that time he was a dear friend of mine jesse thompson who became a teacher of mine in a sense um and i remember going straight on the phone to speak to him about this because it was in the twilight, it wasn't at night time. So, you know, there was no way of mistaking what was going on. Um, and I said, oh, it wasn't like Roy G. Bibb, you know, red, orange, yellow. And he said, he's even a military guy. So he was, you know, no, 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 no. What it was like was this. And he gave me the sequence of colors, which was correct. And I said, oh my God, how did, how did you know that? To which he replied, well, anyone into theosophy or anthroposophy knows that that's it raising its vibrational rate to go somewhere else. And I thought, oh, my God. Um, so angels, what are they? They're spirits, they're angels, they're our friends, they're our ancestors, they're, in, they're our, the, the intelligences that guide us above. And I've no doubt we have to make much more conscious effort to talk to them and be with them. And how do we do that? By learning this language. And walking up, climbing up Jacob's Ladder, which is what the churches should be focusing on. Um, is it wrong that they've finally discovered social work? No. I mean, I, in, in a sense, I wish they'd have discovered it a long time back. You know, have some sort of conscience. How about that for a change? You know, do some good works in the community. How about that for a change? Uh, I'll, I'll finish off now, I promise, John. My trouble is, because it reflects my imposition, is if it's only that and nothing more, do all the good works that you can, but remember your raison d'etre. Handing back, John. Yes, that's that again is, is the point. To not just be social workers, but to be custodians of that which pertains to the divine. Excuse me for a second.
but uh, yeah, and looking at it, you know, I um, I've seen flying orbs too, and really little ones, little elementals. They like to fly around like that. My little mannequin that used to hang around my apartment, he was maybe, I don't know, nine inches tall. And my cat used to chase him around. And he looked like a, a little, he looked like Pinocchio, really, is what he looked like. And, but then he would turn into an orb of light and fly around and my cat would chase it. And when she catch up to it, then she'd be like surprised because there's, you know, there was nothing there. And so you have things that dip in, in and out of other levels of being. And I, many of these like light phenomena that you're talking about, you know, so many people want to reduce that to, oh, it's an extraterrestrial. Well, why does it have to be an extraterrestrial? Why can't it just be a plasma being? You know, uh, Rudolf Steiner talks about uh, the observation of, of angelic beings, uh, nature devas and all of that, and that it's easier to perceive them if you're at a place where two kingdoms come together, like, for example, by the sea where the water and and the air come together in the, in the foam of the waves and all of that, that it's easier to come into a, a perceptual relationship. It's easier to become clairvoyant uh, by the water. It's, and I, I have to attest to that because I lived by the water and I had more uh, perceptual experiences while living by the water, either by a brook at like where my little mannequin friend was, who, by the way, when I was talking to David Spangler one down, one time, and I looked down and that little mannequin was standing there with his hands on his hips, and David Spangler brushed him aside, and we continued on talking, and it cracked me up because it was an affirmation for me that that it wasn't a hallucination, that there was something that was there. And and but and likewise with my cat was was always giving me affirmations. But that was when I lived by a brook, a nice, really nice brook. In fact, the street was Brookside. But and then many of my other experiences when I lived on a lake. And so when you enter into this and you understand that that the the elemental kingdoms of which we're surrounded by at all times, and most people they tell Rudolf Steiner says that people tend to look at look for miracles, that there's certain things that happen in their life that, that to them appear to be miraculous. And he said uh, uh, an individual in the ancient world, like in ancient Greece, would really uh, have looked at that funny because they would think that the, at no point is there not that a relationship to the realm of the supersensible, and that it didn't just crop up on occasion when you had something miraculous happen. So you see that you, when you work with these things, you will run into people that have a, a, a kind of a parallel relationship to, to whatever stage you might be going through. And they may not be, uh, you know, very impressive. I mean, this guy I saw just looked like just some old guy with a suit on and all that, but yet he's He's speaking to me in the green language that I'm hearing with my heart. So who was that guy? I have no idea. But they're out there. They tend to keep to themselves, you know. And so it's it's much like uh, it reminds me of uh, the story of Towler, the, the experience that he had. A, a, an elderly gentleman came to him and asked him, to be his father confessor. And over a period of time, Towler realized that this guy was really his teacher and that he had before him one of those advanced beings of which we all, or any of us that strive within the, the theosophical, anthroposophical context would love to meet one of these uh, great initiates. But this, Initiate guided Toller and he told him, he said, he told him to, to stop talking, be quiet. If for it worked out to be about a month, but he said, be quiet until I tell you to talk again. And so Toller stopped giving his servants and he stayed quiet. He didn't talk to anybody. 
you know, he would write notes if he needed to really instruct somebody about something that was needed. And uh, finally, at the end of that time period, that the friend of God from the Oberland, as he was called, the friend of God from the high country, uh, instructed him that he could begin to speak again. And he went and he gave his next sermon and people were fainting because of the power of his words. So you see that, and that's at uh, what, Cologne Cathedral, and it was it's a big place, you know, and there's people fainting just because there was so much of that heart force that, that was able to come forward in his his speech. And so you you have a really fascinating individual there. And you can go to the Rudolf Steiner uh, website, the Rudolf Steiner archive, and you can look up Friend of God, and then you can find references to him. So that I'm always waiting for a guest. I, you know, I'm ready that, that at any moment, in the most unexpected way, that they could just they show up. You know, they and they, and it's always uh, for me at least. It's always quite uh, non-dramatic. I mean, I had a, a yogi with a turban walk by me one time, and he looked at me, and a spark. Literally, and it crackled. I could hear it, and and that took me by surprise, you know. And but uh, I was reading uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi, and I went home, and and I was getting into that, and I looked in in our our local uh, community college. Was offering a ch uh, class in yoga, and I thought oh, that's great. I mean, I'll go do that. And so, uh, over the next, uh, well, I think it was like two days later, I had this dream, and I was in the upstairs room in these like these little post-war homes that you have all over Detroit, you know. And they have like this attic that's been converted into a room, and it has the, the peak and all that, and the stairs come up, and you're in this room. And I was in this room with a kind of a, a off-white carpet, and there was a guy sitting on a, a, a sheepskin, and he had a turban on, and he was dressed all in white, and he was leading a yoga class. And um, so I ended up going to my yoga class that I signed up for, and that was the guy sitting at the front of the class. And so I ended up, you know, spending many years doing that, and, and then finally, coming to the realization that that really wasn't my path. I'm glad I did it. It, it, it did uh, wonders for me on a physical level because the doctors had told me I wouldn't live beyond the age of 50 when I was, they told me that when I was nine years old, but I'm still around bugging them. And I bet you all the doctors that told me that they're long gone. So that being said, I, I know a great deal about the Eastern path, and I venerate it, and I think for somebody who lives in the East, it's it's ideal. But uh, as far as for myself, I think that, you know, you can have those kinds of experiences to where you end up finding somebody in a dream, and then you end up, they end up becoming your yoga teacher, you know. And it, by the way, he was sitting on a sheepskin. And I of course, I had never had any contact with this particular group of Sikhs and, and all of that. And I learned a lot. And I used to go to these training courses in the uh, Sangre de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico and all of that. I did all this for a great many years. And in trying to understand this within a, a modern context, but I always returned to uh, Rudolf Steiner's work. And that became... Uh, the way in which I could understand what these things might mean for me. You, of course, you know, however you want to approach it, that's that's your path and destiny. Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, certainly I've always returned to Rudolf Steiner as well um, because we need someone, I think, with a, a knowledge of the Cartesian. We need someone who can understand the arguments and the flow of Western culture and contribute to it and do better than it in many ways. I mean, the reason I never say I'm exhausted, John, I can't do it, this show after our, our time of worship uh, in, in a physical church is that I think this is an extension of that time of worship. 
this is true church. You know, we, we, we meet together regularly. We're beginning to talk about unusual activities of spirit, activities of mind and consciousness. We're sharing things with each other. We've got a central map maker um, who is helping to guide us into these elaborately complex fields of inquiry. And, I, you know, for me, this has all the hallmarks of genuine church and what church needs to become. Um, not, not the pseudo pretend side of it. I mean, I know to, years back, what was his name? Morris Cirillo, Morris Cirillo, one of those um, Pentecostal preachers that turns up every now and again from Latin America. By the way, I've got Pentecostal friends, and some of them are remarkable people. Not all of them are remarkable people, and I can't remember. So forgive me, Morris Cirillo, if it's not you. I'll have to look at my notebook from, you know, that dusty notebook from all those years ago. Um, and this guy who didn't even turn up in person. How about that for disrespect to your audience? Um, he, he, you know, it's one of his young ministers, one of his young subordinates turned up and said, blah, blah, wished he was here. How rude. Um, and it was before the days when people had cell phones, mobile phones. Uh, you know, when they're on these weird walkie-talkie-like devices, which I sort of half remember, and it was in a very large – I'm trying to remember that – as I was speaking about it recently, the mechanics of this story, you know, the minutiae of the story the other day. Uh, I was telling my partner, you know, the, the mechanics. It might have been Earl's Court, um, which is a huge auditorium behind the station. You know, it was packed to the brim. And I, I was listening to this guy and what he had to say <clears throat> until it got to the first collection. Uh, and then every, every bit of, of anger that was in my body began to explode. I mean, these were vulnerable, uneducated people in the audience from different parts of the planet. Lots of people come to the City of London to make money for their families, to, to make money to sent to their home countries, their hometowns, villages, and what's wrong with that? Um, but they were not the most educated. They were being told half-truths from the platform, which and you didn't need five PhDs to work that out. Um, they were being given a doctrine rather than having their minds set free. Obviously, none of the people at the front had ever heard that ye shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. They'd never read John. Um, and these buckets all of a sudden turned up and were being forced down the line uh, of very vulnerable minority ethnic groups. Um, and they were throwing money into these buckets. They were throwing money into these buckets. As this young fraud at the front was saying, can you all go into your prayer languages now? Now, he didn't say speak in tongues because he probably knew uh, complete buggers like me would have thought, well, they're not speaking ancient Greek. They're not speaking Hebrew. You know, it's not glossolalia. It's a, a prayer language. You know, one guy in front of me started going, ooh, bar, boo, bar, boo, bar, boo, bar, boo, bar. Right, what language is that then, right? And it, it was made worse by there was a rather large black lady at the end of that particular row and you could tell in her eyes, you could tell in her body language, she felt she was the one that needed to go into a trance. You could tell that. And all of a sudden, she stood up and made this weird little squeal. I've never heard anything quite like it. Then passed out um, in this trance-like state. What she hadn't thought through was she was a size. She was a size. She managed to knock everybody else in that row off their seat when she fell backwards. And she was in such a trance, her left eye suddenly opened like peeping to see how much carnage she'd caused. Um, and her prayer language was something like whoopee doopy. This is insulting. Uh, nevertheless, they all recovered themselves enough to put money in those buckets they didn't have. And when the bucket started coming in my direction, I was so angry, I nearly threw it at the guy with the walkie-talkie. And they're very good at weeding people out. Uh, I, was, I heard him say, we've got a problem in row blah, 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 seat blah. Oh, my God, that's me. 
and they asked me to leave and escorted me to the door. Um, that happens in churches across the Western Hemisphere on a regular basis. When there are real mysteries, when there are real interactions with the paranormal, when there are real engagements with the supernatural that need discussing and sharing and learning from. That's, I think, the reason that makes me so angry, not only with the false good works of certain groups, but also the false blessings of the spirit of certain groups, not only to bring us all into disrepute, it's actually mean and nasty and quite wicked by preying on the vulnerable who don't have those resources to share in the first place. We need this type of church. We need to listen to each other with the maps made by a master to learn a language that transforms us body and soul. Just a thought. Yeah, it reminds me of my old friend Edmund. He used to be the manager for Lenny Bruce, the comedian. And Lenny Bruce has this one story he talked about how there was this uh, big church in, in a wealthy section of town and Jesus walks in the back of the church and and the incongruity of the the bishop's rings and the, I can't remember, you know, I haven't heard it in 50 years, but uh, I guess the point of fact is that, is that, is that really what it's all about, you know? Is uh, that whole parade. That being said, you know, yeah, you do have to keep the wolf away from the door. And so I hope that uh, somebody might uh, bring it upon themselves to buy us a cup of coffee on occasion. For Reverend David, you can use paypal.me forward slash D Perry 777. And for myself, John Barnwell 888 with the paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. That being said, uh, Reverend David's wonderful partner and editor, Daniela Hadi Irinduce, in his new book, uh, On the Philosophy of Education Towards an Anthroposophical View. Really quite remarkable. And, it, and it's unlike any other book I've read on uh, Waldorf education, because it he has a background in a lot of subjects that your average person teaching Waldorf education does not have. So it's a very unique perspective. And so you could uh, get a free uh, digital version of that or a print version from Amazon. And so by all means, check it out. There's a link below. And for Reverend David here, he has three books. Uh, the first book is Shakespearean Study, The Grammar of Witchcraft. And no, it's not a grimoire, as I always say. And he has his Shakespearean S poetry, Caliban's Redemption, that magical touch of Caliban that David is so fond of with his background in theater. And of course, his major work here is Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg in the Arts, edited by Daniela Hadi Irinduz. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Martha Keith Shushard, the notable scholar on uh, the Jacob, uh, the, the King James, period of King James and how Freemasonry ties into all of that. Uh, she has a friend who wanted to get in touch with me. And I just want to say to her, this woman who's uh, a Swedenborgian publisher, uh, formerly, that uh, I don't answer phone calls from any numbers I don't recognize. So you're going to have to get me some information because I haven't heard from you. And I, on a daily basis, block at least five or six phone numbers from these these unusual situations. Now, if you go back to Reverend David's books, they are available on Amazon and well worth the time that you would spend enjoying his gift for language. And for myself, I only have two books. The first book is some 640 pages, and that is The Arcana of the Grail Angel, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, 
of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian Order. It has a foreword by Douglas Gabriel, my best buddy over at American Intelligence Media, and is loaded with a great many diagrams and bibliography and all of that uh, based on the diagrams of Aaron Pfeiffer that I saw many years ago, handwritten diagrams. And uh, But all those diagrams are also reproduced in my second volume, plus I created a great many more. So there's more many more diagrams in the second volume than in the first. And they, they go hand in hand. And this is the Arcana of Light on the Path. They are vo both available on eBay from me directly. Uh, if you're outside the continental US, you can contact me through my academia link below or through private message on Facebook and I can make arrangements with you somehow through PayPal to be able to get the books to you. And uh, But I also want to be uh, very thankful to uh, those people that this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla, Vadim, Vivian, Neil, Christian, Mark, Maud, Druvman, Laura, Paula, Rick, Michael, Beth, Ishtar, and many others over the years. I want to thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. And... Uh, Nothing like an old apple pop up to block the screen. You gotta wonder, apple, what that's malum in Latin. That malum is evil, right? Is my computer really evil? Is that true? So in any regard, that's the efforts that we've put out in the past. And, and I've gotten some really nice feedback from people that have, have uh, taken the time to, to, to check my books out, and I think they could be very helpful for anybody who's attempting to, to grasp the, the understudy, the study of time and space in, in, that is unfolded within the work of Rudolf Steiner, who is really the great initiate of time. He has given out more regarding the qualities of time than, than any being that I know of. And so uh, today, I don't want to belabor Reverend David here, because I know what he's kind of cooked when he when he goes through a whole service and then comes here and and kind of does it all over again. So I want to pass it off to him and uh, don't forget to click click like and subscribe and all those things that apparently are helpful and share it and uh, maybe we can enlarge our community. Like David said last week, this doesn't have to be a small community. This could be a medium-sized community. <laughs> and, but David, usually uh, it's, it's customary that he, he leads us in a prayer to, to bring blessing on our endeavor here, our humble endeavor. And just two things quickly. I, I think what we're doing actually is keeping the wolf from the door and not having wolves on the stage devouring sheep in a room i mean I, I think that's entirely different um yes good works need supporting uh but, when, but be, people need to be careful that they're actually supporting good works and not the semblance of good works just trying to defraud and rob um yeah we need i think i don't see why this group can't grow and grow because we're a community of communicators we share ideas with each other you know, it, it, the big thing nowadays is, is immersive. Everything's got to be immersive. But this show is. I mean, there's a primary discussion and other people get involved in either a secondary or primary way themselves. You know, this is a community. It's it's a church. And I can't imagine anything more exciting on YouTube. You know, people taking these subjects seriously and learning together about their meaning and value. I think that's incredibly important. My friends, a brief prayer this evening, because John is right. Frazzled is the word that comes to mind, as opposed to anything else. Um, I normally pray about interior things, interiority, because I, for me, that's the essence of prayer and meditation. Today, I'd like to pray for the world, uh, the peoples of the world, our place in the world, the decision makers, the Windsors, 
if any group of people needed prayer, it's the Windsors. I'd like to pray for, what was it, the 65th? I'd like to pray for the 65th and those amazing disruptions he makes in his speeches. Absolutely astonishing. The one that caught my attention most. Was American, how many? 46. 46. The one that caught my attention most was America can be summed up in one word. Futh -futh 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 -futh, which... <laughs> Which I'm sorry, you know, let's keep that right, levity. No one's attacking, right? It's just amazing. Uh, let's pray for our exterior circumstances that we can all learn to understand each other better, to sympathize with each other's predicaments, to remember we never know what's going on in somebody else's life, and to just be patient, be patient and kind to everyone we meet. Great Jesus Christ, teach us the lessons of patience and kindness and be with us all in those luminous steps and those gifts until we meet again amen amen and, and don't forget uh michio kushi once said that someday even al capone will have supreme judgment thank you all for showing up and enjoy your week and happy fourth by the way